Hello, my name is Mary Wild. I'm a professor at the School of Nursing at the University of Rochester in, in the United States. I'm also a member of the International Continent Society Nurses Committee. I'm delighted to be here today to talk with you about my research in self-management of people with indwelling urinary catheters. Our purpose today is to educate continence nurses to improve patient care and health outcomes globally. At the conclusion of my presentation today, I hope you would be able to examine the evidence and research related to self-management in long-term urinary catheter users, describe, describe best practices for promoting self-management, and use theoretical concepts related to this area. These are the indications for long-term catheter use. Intractable urinary retention for those who cannot manage an intermittent cath with an intermittent catheter or who have no cath caregiver to do it. Also people who have difficulty getting to the bathrooms uh, and that really prevent them from using an intermittent catheter. Bladder outlet obstruction, which has not been surgically treated or perhaps cannot be. Improving comfort for end-of-life care. And also alternatives uh, are listed here that you should be considering in, instead of using a long-term catheter, toil using a toileting schedule when there's no retention, obviously an intermittent catheter, uh, a condom or a sheath catheter for men who are able to manage with this and who do not have obstructed urine or persistent retention. Long-term catheter use is uh, sometimes a little confusing in that we uh, talk about it as being over one month's duration, but it often extends to many years. The average that I've found in my research is between three and four years, but I've also had people who've had the catheter well over 20 years. Indefinite use or permanent catheterization would probably be a more accurate term, but there's no agreement on terminology. Both catheter types and catheter use have been called um, short-term and long-term catheters, which is really causes some confusion. There's very little research in urinary catheter self-management. It's not uncommon to have this kind of research in people with chronic conditions, such as people with asthma or diabetes, but not for people with catheters. I've worked in this area of research for um, well over 20 years, almost 30, and I, I know that uh, this is still a developing area. Long-term catheter users uh, learn often by trial and error, and they usually lack support, even for people with multiple sclerosis who might be in a support group, they might not be talking about having a catheter because it's a stigma and it often in indicates a decline in their health. People with catheters are often told to drink, 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 but often not about how much or how to manage. This is an overview of my research program showing how it was developed inductively. I've conducted seven previous studies in people with indwelling catheters, and all but one, a chart audit, involved talking with the person with the catheter and often with caregivers as well. I started with discovering what the main catheter problems were back in the 1980s when I asked people what it was like to live with a catheter, followed by ex examining key catheter problems and how these were related. Since that time, I've been addressing what catheter users themselves can do to prevent or minimize their problems. I also conducted two studies in people with intermittent catheters and expanded my theoretical framework to them. In my final PowerPoint presentation, which is another, uh, another one, I present information on intermittent catheter users' self-management. This is a listing of the typical problems of catheter users uh, that they and their caregivers must address in self-management. They need to be able to prevent cauti, catheter-associated urinary tract infection, avoid leakage or bypassing of urine that causes skin problems and as well as <clears throat> the use of absorbent products. They also need to <coughs> excuse me, minimize catheter blockage and, and the frequent changes that come with it and the disruption in their daily lives. And they need to prevent accidental dislodgement with the catheter either falling out or the trauma that results from it being pulled out. The daily routines of catheter users are very often disrupted. particularly in the quality of life affected, particularly in people with indwelling catheters, 
because it disrupts those daily routines for the, the users and their families. I often heard this, it's okay when it's working right. When the catheter is working well, it seems to be in the background, like not noticing when you're wearing glasses. But it moves front and center to the foreground when there's a problem. One of my study participants, who I called Kevin, talked about getting wet on a bus. He said, Psst, you're really soaked. It ruins the day. It ruins whatever you're driving in. You have to go back and get changed and probably not even be able to go out. Nurses and physicians in home care or clinics are often the ones who help their patients troubleshoot or manage the catheter problems, frequently during evening and weekend hours. Thus, catheter problems cause excess health care utilization. While we often think of this technology as minor, it's not. It's not to the patient. And a choice of suprapubic or urethral catheter should be carefully considered between the patient and provider. Sexual activity can be more positive with the suprapubic, but it's not always. Body image, for instance, can be affected by the placement of a suprapubic catheter, and that can affect one's sexuality. Some people who are no longer wet, though, look at the catheter as a benefit. In one study, some catheter users developed more self-reliance as they dealt with catheter problems, but for others, an indwelling catheter was not so positive. For instance, it's often too hard to get bathroom access when emptying the bag so that people have to plan for accessible bathrooms or adjust their outings. People have told me very often that they can get into the bathroom, but they cannot close the door behind themselves so they don't have any privacy. This is a slide showing analysis of data on 202 long-term indwelling catheter users who were in my self-management intervention study, which I'm going to tell you about uh, shortly. They self-reported these problems for the previous two, two months prior to randomization in the trial, including caudi blockage and accidental dislodgement. Additional data on leaking, sediment, kiss, kinks and twists bladder spasms, and autonomic dysreflexia indicate that these catheter problems are frequent even in a two-month period. The data show that some people have to manage them as often as daily. Likewise, the extra health care costs are large for people with catheter-related problems, and it's, it's large for a smaller percentage of people who tend to have these problems. Particularly large uh, costs are accrued from people who need care in the emergency department or the hospital. Notice that the emergency department is often used not just for cauti and blockage, but also for catheter changes. 31% used it within a two-month period that, this, um, data were, that these data were from, and that was just astonishing to me. This figure on self-management uh, is has been published by the American Journal of Nursing. It was created by Kara Tannenbaum, a physician from Montreal, who used it with uh, three other uh, myself and three other nurses at the International Continent Society workshop in Glasgow in 2012. This is a, a very general self-management approach that we found useful for nurses and physicians. And I'm going to quote you from the article briefly. Self-management begins with a patient-identified problem. The self-management behaviors that address the problem operate as in a feedback loop, with patients becoming increasingly knowledgeable about their needs and strategies that work best for them as they come closer to attaining each goal. Self-efficacy supports self-management behaviors, and each behavior, in turn, promotes self-efficacy. I'm going to talk with you now about my randomized clinical trial to teach indwelling catheter users, and there were 202 of them, about self-management of their catheter. As you see on this slide, these are the names of my key colleagues for the study. The study was conducted in western and central New York State in the United States and with the visiting nurse service in New York City. This is a, the theoretical model that we use for this study. You can see how awareness and self-monitoring that's in the third box are parts of catheter self-management. And we believe this is an iterative process between awareness and self-monitoring with self-management behaviors. We also believe there is a feedback loop with self-efficacy 
as improved self-monitoring can increase confidence to self-manage. And these are our outcomes. Urinary tract infection, blockage, displacement or dislodgement of the catheter, and increased health care utilization and quality of life. The self-management intervention involved four contacts with a study nurse, two home visits a week apart in the first month to teach use of the urinary diary and to review the educational booklet. There were 20 pages in this educational booklet, but we focused on um, urine flow related to fluids and to preventing dislodgement. A follow-up phone call was done two weeks later to adjust, adjust goals and find out if there were additional questions in a final uh, booster home visit of four months. Catheter users were taught to increase their awareness and self-monitoring of their own patterns of urine flow and to modify self-management behavior as needed. We had a 74% completion rate for 12 months with attrition similar in both arms of the study. This slide de describes the sample. We had similar numbers of women and men, a wide range in age, almost half with a suprapubic tube. The group was diverse by race, ethnicity, and they were highly disabled. For instance, their CAT score was 7.75 and a score of 10 would mean that they need assistance with all activities of daily living bathing, dressing, toileting, and um, getting out of bed as well as feeding. Self-reported diagnosis include mostly spinal cord injury, 40%, multiple sclerosis, 23%, diabetes, 12%, prostate, 10%, um, neurogenic bladder not reported, and Parkinson's, 12%, or, uh, excuse me, 2%. This is the catheter calendar used by both the intervention, oops, next page, um, and the control groups to remind them for their bi-monthly phone calls that took place over a year of catheter adverse events and the associated additional health care costs. And you can see th that we have the problems listed with a simple code of B, U, and D, and then we have treatments, and that helped us really understand what was going on. This is, uh, of course, for both groups that the data collection was done. The next slide gives the first page of our intervention booklet and this was only used for the experimental group. Many people in my previous research told me that they did not know how much to drink, but they were always told, drink, drink, drink. I also noticed in one study that several men were drinking 4,000 to, 4, to 8,000 milliliters a day and they didn't realize that this was too much. That can wash away some of the, the, the good components of the urine that's protect, that are protective. So we taught people to be more aware of their own patterns and that fluid intake should be at an optimal and consistent level throughout the day. We estimated fluid requirements as 30 milliliters per kilogram of body weight and we calculated this for them. We also suggested that they pay attention to the color of the urine as an easy way to monitor fluid intake. The other major part of the intervention was to prevent traction and accidental dislodgement which can damage the, ur damage the urinary meatus or bladder neck and possibly contribute to cowdy from that trauma. Preventing kinks and twists could prevent bladder over dissension and also help uh, to decrease cowdies. These are tips from my previous research from study participants and we use these in the, in the educational booklet to help people to learn through what we call a vicarious observation or learning from others like them, which is a part of Bandura's self-efficacy theory, which was foundational for our study. This is a list of problems and strategies in the educational booklet. As I said before, we taught everyone to pay attention to fluids and prevent dislodgement of the catheter, but the study nurse also addressed other strategies based on the person's interests and needs, and they had this educational booklet to keep with them so they could use it dif differently over time. This is one of the basic pages in our teaching intervention. The nurse would now tailor the teaching to the person's needs, for instance, adding orange juice or cranberry juice to water to improve the taste or by noticing the color of urine to judge the fluids that are needed. 
We also taught everyone to pay attention to their own signs and symptoms of Cowdy for quicker treatment. These are some of the most common symptoms from our cross-sectional analysis at baseline. The difference in symptoms is remarkable in comparison with short-term catheter users or in people without catheters at all. In our study of 202 people who reported these symptoms by recall from the previous two months, we found that urine color and odor changes were listed first and second in frequency. Generalized symptoms was reported uh, next, or often, excuse me, including malaise, which was third, weakness, fourth. Sediment was the fifth most uh, common symptom. Fever was reported 11th and chills 9th in frequency, and this is, again, very different from people without catheters. For people with spinal cord injury, autonomic dysreflexia is common. This next slide explains what this is. Um, not everybody know, has heard of autonomic dysreflexia, but it's a syndrome related to a reflex of imbalanced discharges which, which uh, come out at the level of the spinal cord injury above or at thoracic level 6. It can lead to severe hypertension and a life-threatening situation if it's not addressed quickly. So it's really important to know. It is most often caused by a, a blocked or poorly functioning catheter or an overly full bag. Constipation or pressure ulcers can also cause autonomic dysreflexia. So people who have this symptom with a urinary tract infection need to get onto it quickly and, um, and, and take action so they, they don't get severely sick. The results of the study. These are the main results. Cowdy and dislodgement outcomes did not differ by group by GEE analysis. Blockage, however, was significantly lower in the intervention group by presence or absence, which was asked every two months, during the first six months of the study, but this result did not last for the, the full 12 months. Rates per 1,000 catheter days for each of these main um, outcomes, cowdy, dislodgement, and blockage, were, however, um, lower for both groups, and they, they declined kind of gradually over the time period. The intervention group had more emergency department and hospitalizations for cowdy, which we were surprised about, but they also had higher self-reported severity scores for cowdy. However, we were not powered well for that infrequent event and were not really able to determine whether this was a true group difference. Our conclusion is that both groups improved over time. A simple to use catheter problems calorie calendar and the bimonthly interviews might have functioned like a modest form of an additional self monitoring intervention that was in operation for controls as well as the experimental group. Blockage improvement in the experimental group might have been related to the key fluid intake component of the intervention, but the effect did not last for the full 12 months of the study. It is also not known whether this was truly of benefit because the control group also improved. Symptom identification, severity of UTIs, and getting care early could be related to hospitalization for Cowdy in the intervention group. Our implications for this study is that we would need to recommend more follow-up time with an interventionist nurse to sustain the catheter self-management intervention. In real life, this would not be a problem because nurses very often make home visits every four to six weeks to change catheters for patients. There would be additional value in teaching related to optimal fluid intake, and instead of just saying drink, drink, help the person to know how much and integrate the awareness about how to do this in daily life. The catheter calendar is a very simple form of an intervention and it would be easy to implement. Patterns of catheter problems could be more easily discerned and nurses can advise that patients share information from their calendar during visits with their provider. For dissemination, the U.S. National Institutes of Nursing Research, who funded this study, stipulates that the products of this research like the urinary diary and the educational work or a booklet can be used only for education and research, not commercial products. The ICS nurses group will be making uh, these available and we will uh, disseminate this 
on this website in relationship to this PowerPoint present presentation. But you need to be in contact with me, uh, and I have I will you know have my um, email available to you um, at that um, website address. Okay. Uh, at the time that you would like to work on this, you will be able to modify and um, and use these products at no cost, and we will simply have a, a contract uh, that is a free contract uh, for you to work this out with our intellectual property department. Thank you very much. These are our references, and I want to thank you not only for myself, but also for the International Continent Society Nurses Committee.